Okay? This is full spectrum dominance. As they say on the airlines, if you're not flying to full spectrum dominance, you're on the wrong plane. Okay, all right. Well, my name is Bruce Gagnon. I live in Bath, Maine, and I work for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. I thought I'd start with a story. Uh, I uh, grew up in a military family. My dad was in the Air Force, and we moved all over the world. And then I tried to join the Air Force in 1971, but I actually flunked my induction physical because of an old high school football injury. So I had to get a waiver to get into the military when most people were trying to get out during the Vietnam War. And after my training, I was sent to Travis Air Force Base in California that was an airlift base for the war in Vietnam. And as it turned out, my first roommate in the barracks was one of the leading organizers in the GI resistance movement. And I've always felt that I was like given this gift from the heavens to be put in this room because at night they would have meetings and I'm sitting in the corner thinking, oh my God, these are all commies. <laughs> And, you know, I grew up behind the barbed wire fences on the military basis. I was a right winger. I was a young Republican for Nixon in 68 as, as a 16 year old organizing for the Nixon campaign in Northwest Florida. So conservative there, they call it Lower Alabama. And so that's, that was my orientation. So being in this room where these people would have meetings a couple nights a week, White guys talking about the war, black guys talking about racism in America, they were Black Panthers. Changed my life completely. And after, it took me about six months and my whole life was, you know, completely changed. And I got out of the military and I was going to college in Florida, the University of Florida, just ready to graduate. And I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union to become an organizer of fruit pickers in Florida. And so I never finished college and I've been an organizer ever since. And so it, now fast forward to 1982. I'm living in Orlando, Florida, the pit of hell. <laughs> and I'm watching C-SPAN and they're covering this huge demonstration in New York City, almost a million people protesting against nuclear weapons. And when it was over, they cut away to a right-wing conference, and the speaker was Lieutenant General Daniel Graham, Ronald Reagan's head of SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars. And in the Q&A after General Graham's speech, somebody says, General Graham, aren't you worried? They say there's almost a million people protesting in New York today against nuclear weapons. He said, no, I think it's fantastic. They're out there protesting against nuclear weapons and we're moving into space and they don't have a clue. Let them keep doing what they're doing. And so it was in that moment that I said, holy shit, you know, I, I gotta start looking at this. Here I live in Orlando, part of the Space Coast as it's called. And so the next year, 83, I went to work for the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice where I worked for 15 years and we began taking people to the space center over and over and over again, protesting military satellite launches, protesting uh, rocket launches, uh, and protesting against uh, nuclear power launches because the nuclear industry views space as a new market and wants to use nuclear power in space to mine, to mine the planets and the asteroids for these precious minerals. You know, they say the Earth is the Mars Society actually says that the Earth is a rotting, stinking, dying planet and that we need to move our civilization to Mars. They want us to terraform Mars. Do you know what terraform means? Turn it into a green, livable planet. Can you imagine the cost of terraforming Mars? The president of Lockheed, uh, excuse me, the president of the Mars Society is an executive at Lockheed Martin <laughs> who would build the rockets for these missions. In fact, you've heard of the Halliburton Corporation, right? They're building a drilling mechanism to mine Mars. 
And these little rovers that are driving around Mars today are doing soil identification and sampling because they believe that magnesium and cobalt and uranium are on Mars, helium-3 and water on the moon, gold on the asteroids. And so they say, don't worry that we're running out of resources on the planet Earth because we can go and mine the sky in the future. And so one of the jobs of the Space Command today, part of full spectrum dominance, is to build a parallel military highway between the Earth and the planetary bodies so that when the day comes that you can actually go out and mine the sky, that you have the technology to do it, they want to control the pathway on and off the planet Earth. In fact, in a congressional study called Military, Sports, uh, Military Space Forces <laughs> the Next 50 Years, commissioned by the Congress, this study was, in the 80s, they say in there that we would be able to hijack rival shipments upon return if they were not authorized to leave the planet and go out into mine the sky. So this is the level of planning and, and uh, space technology development now underway today by NASA, which is controlled, always been controlled by the Pentagon. I think it's important to also remember the story about the Nazi scientists that were brought to the United States at the end of World War II. Werner von Braun, Major General Walter Dornberger. Dornberger was in charge of the Hitler V1 and V2 rocket program that Hitler used to terrorize London and Paris and Brussels at the end of the war. Dornberger came to New York and became vice president of Bell Aeros Aerosystems in New York. And he testified before the Congress in the 1950s and said, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the Third World War. I lost two already. And he talked about the importance of orbiting battle stations that would allow the United States to control the Earth below, but also, again, to control the pathway on and off the planet. So these are the technologies. And these Nazis were the scientists that helped bring those technologies to the US. They basically created the U.S. space program after the war was over. They also, because there were about a thousand of these Nazis brought over, they were also brought into the CIA to help create the CIA because they had all the figures, they knew who all the communists were throughout Europe. And they were brought into this, create the CIA. They were brought in to create the flight medicine program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. They were the Nazi scientists that were doing mind control experiments in uh, Germany on the Jews and other prisoners of war. They were brought over to create the LSD and MK Ultra mind control experiments in the 60s. You remember when people were jumping out of windows from bad LSD trips and all that? Those were the Nazi scientists. And so I've always asked the question, was there an ideological contamination that came along with these Nazi scientists. Deutschland über alles, master of space. The slogan, the logo that they wear on their uniform at the Space Command headquarters in Colorado Springs. One of my friends, uh, Ardeth Platty, uh, a nun, I've heard her say a few times, we can kill him fast, or we can kill them slow. America has become a killing culture. And now our culture is being militarized. About two years ago, a friend of mine that works at Bath Ironworks in Maine, where I live, he's worked there 35 years building Aegis destroyers. He and I learned that Sears had a new clothing line for kids, for boys. And so we went to the next town to the Sears store and we went in there into the little boys' section, and there they were, a whole line of military uniforms for little boys. Now, it's not rich kids that buy clothes at Sears. They're working class people, poor people. And so the message that is being planted in the minds of working class and poor people, especially children in this country, is this is all you're going to be. This is your future in America. Colleges 
and universities across the country. Mathematics department, computer, computer engineering department, physics department, astronomy departments. As their budgets are being cut because of state uh, funding crisis, those departments are turning to the Pentagon for funding. But when you sign a pact with the devil, you become the devil. And so we see now the militarization of academia across the country. A friend of mine, Bob Anderson, in Albuquerque, tells a story about on, at the state public university of New Mexico in Albuquerque, they now have a walled off secret part of the campus where all the weapons corporations working with Kirtland Air Force Base are doing high-tech space weapons uh, research and development and you're not allowed to go uh, onto this place on the campus, on this public university campus. So we see this militarization of our culture here in America today and that's why so many communities are on their knees Politicians, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. They're on their knees begging for drone uh, bases, drone testing sites, missile defense deployment sites, you name it. Anything to keep the dollars flowing because that's the job policy of America today is weaponization and militarization. That's what we are. We've become a killing culture. Earlier I mentioned that that the Pentagon's been using the words for some time now, security export. You know, that our role under corporate globalization not, will not be to make things anymore. We're not gonna make shoes, cars, refrigerators, clothing. We're gonna make weapons. And so it's no coincidence that today that the number one industrial export product of America is what? Weapons and when weapons are your number one industrial export, what's your global marketing strategy for that product line? There we are. Obama has announced, the good Democrat, has announced that we're going to pivot into the Asia Pacific now. That 60% of the U.S. Navy will now be redeployed into the Asia Pacific. For what? North Korea? North Korea? Are you kidding? When North Korea did one of their satellite launches about three years ago, I remember reading in the aerospace industry press these, these U.S. Air Force people mocking them, laughing at them, saying they don't have enough satellite technology to even track their own space uh, launch. They said we were tracking it the whole way, but they couldn't even track it. They're not the enemy. They're not who we're going after in the region. Although we, we heighten, you know, we create the fear about North Korea in order to get the American people all jacked up so they'll go along with this pivot. But in fact, it is not aimed at them. It is, in fact, aimed at China. And so I think the determination has been made that while we can't compete with China economically in the future, if we control their access to resources, we hold the keys to their economic engine. And China imports 80% of their oil on ships. And so if the US could theoretically embargo or blockade their importation of resources, then we hold the gun to their head, right? We call the shots. And so I believe that's the strategy underway today. Very dangerous, very provocative, very expensive for the American people, but that's the strategy. NATO is being brought into this. NATO that has been expanding after the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mikhail Gorbachev was worried about NATO expansion. He was promised NATO will not expand one centimeter into the former Eastern Bloc. When Bill Clinton became president, he began violating that promise, and today we see NATO on steroids. Moving into Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, right on Russia's border. Now talking about moving into Georgia on Russia's border. Missile defense deployments in Romania. Missile defense radars in Turkey. Missile defense deployments in Poland. 
and then U.S. and NATO warships moving into Balt Baltic Sea and other regions. Now that the Arctic ice is melting, moving up there as well, competing with Russia for control of the oil under the Arctic Ocean. And so NATO and its allies being brought into this encirclement of both Russia, who has the world's largest supply of natural gas, and China. The U.S. has been recently deploying missile defense systems in Japan, Okinawa, South Korea, Taiwan, and on Aegis, Navy Aegis destroyers that are built where I live in Bath, Maine, beginning this coastal encirclement of China. As a result of this Obama pivot, they say, you know, we're going to need more bases, more ports of call. And so there's pressure now on Guam, the Philippines, Vietnam, other places to open up the bases that we were using before or to increase the size of existing bases. And then that's where Jeju Island comes in. Many of you, I hope, have heard about little Jeju Island just off the Korean Peninsula. And on the south side of Jeju Island is a little village called Gangjon Village. I know Anne has been there. We've been, we tried to get several members from Veterans for Peace there one time. Elliot and Tarek Koff and Mike Hasty from Oregon. They got off the airplane. They were met by security who had their picture and they sent them home. Since then, we've been able to get other members of Veterans for Peace to go there. We're a little more discreet about it. This island on the south side, this village, Gangjon Village, is 500-year-old village where they worship nature. And just offshore are these UNESCO-recognized soft coral reefs that are the most unbelievable. The videos and pictures of these things, they're alive and moving. Unbelievable. And today they're out there dredging in order to make it possible for the U.S. to bring aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines and these Aegis destroyers into this Navy base that is being built there in the village. And so these endangered soft coral reefs will be destroyed as a result of this base. And the sacred rocky coast, Gurumbi they call it, where they've worshipped nature and the passing of their relatives in all these years, has been blasted by the Samsung Corporation that is the lead contractor. They have a construction division, Samsung. They and a couple of other corporations control South Korean government. And so they're going to cover this rocky coast with cement to build the docks. Now the United States, when you talk to politicians about it, they say, what are you talking about? We don't know anything about Jeju Island. We don't have anything to do with it. But a few years ago, I was trying to get Americans to call the South Korean embassy in Washington to say, don't build this base. And I was told, and I heard from several of my friends, they emailed me, they were told the same thing. Don't call us, call your government. They're twisting our arm, making us build this base. This is one of our cost-sharing deals. We get the allies to share costs. They build the bases, they pay for base expansion. This is how you know we cut costs of the empire now as the citizens at home begin to effectively demand, you know, some cuts in the military spending. So the people on Jeju, beleaguered as they are, have an incredible spirit. After six years now, of daily, daily, and nightly now, it's turning into 24 hours a day protest against the construction of this Navy base. They still gather and they still sing to each other and they dance to each other nightly as a way to maintain their spirit, like the Civil Rights Movement. Resilient, love, determination, because they know something about fascism. At the end of World War II, when the United States beat the Japanese that were occupying Korea, Japanese driven out of Korea, who did the U.S. put in charge of Korea? 
at the end of World War II. The former collaborators, the Koreans who collaborated with the Japanese fascists, were put in charge of Korea by the United States. The very worst Koreans you can imagine, right? The traitors betrayed the people. We put them in charge. And so the people revolted. This, is, this was the seeds of the Korean War. And on Jeju Island, they revolted as well. And the US military directed a crackdown on the people there. And up to 80,000 people on Jeju Island were killed. They called it the April 3rd Massacre. April 3rd, 1948 began this massacre that led to the deaths of more than 80,000 people on the island, just the island alone. And so today, they see this Navy base being built, and they feel that boot of the American fascism one more time on their neck. And it's ironic because as a way to kind of apologize to the people of Jeju some years ago, the South Korean government named Jeju the Peace Island, the Island of Peace. And now on the Island of Peace comes this US Navy base, and there's talk of an Air Force base to come with it and more. So I've been telling people that Jeju is the perfect symbol for all of us of this reality of Obama's pivot into the Asia Pacific. The environmental implications, the human rights implications, the peace implications, all coming together in this struggle on Jeju Island. So on the table out here, I urge you to pick up this newsletter and learn more about it. Every, every year for the past several years, I've been reading about it in magazine Aviation Week and Space Technology. The Space Command gathers and they do a computer war game of an attack on China set in the year 2016. And I talked earlier about the X-37, the military space plane that stayed up in orbit for more than 400 days, a super drone. And in this computer war game set in the year 2016, it flies down from orbit and drops an attack on China. China today has 20 nuclear missiles that are capable of hitting, reaching the west coast of the United States. And so in this first strike, the US tries to take out those 20 nuclear missiles. And the first weapon used is the X-37, and then other, other technologies are used as well and a follow-on in, in that first strike. But China inevitably is able to fire a couple of their nuclear missiles in a retaliatory strike. And that's when the so-called missile defense system is used, the shield. After the first strike sword plunges into the heart of Russia or China, they then fire their retaliatory capability, and that's when these so-called missile defense systems, defense is the wrong word, isn't it? because it's a key element of first strike attack, planning. But that's why Russia and China today are just freaking out over these missile defense deployments that are surrounding both of their countries on land, on sea. And Russia is saying, wait a minute, you keep doing this, NATO keeps expanding, you bring these missile defense systems surrounding us, we're gonna pull out of that new START treaty that we signed with Obama. Modest as it was, modest reductions of nuclear weapons. But we're going to have to pull out of it because we can't afford to get rid of any of our nuclear weapons because we've got to have a retaliation against your missile defense system. China's saying, wait a minute, we might only have 20 nuclear missiles, but heck, we're going to have to buy some submarines now and make some submarines and take some of those missiles and put them under the ocean so they're survivable. And so we we're off to a new arms race. As we're being told that missile defense is good for us and it's gonna protect us. And remember what I said earlier, Fort Drum up here in upstate New York is on the list, competing with Maine to be the East Coast deployment site for missile defense. So keep your eye on that ball. One more issue for you to work on up here. Just what you needed, right? <laughs> Thank you.
it's, it's a lot of bad news, I will say. But the good part of it is, for me, is in the work that I do with the Global Network, we were created in 1992, and early on what we discovered was, as we learned about space, is that in order to tie this whole space warfare program together, the U.S. had to set up bases all over the world. Downlink stations, big, imagine these big radoms, these big white golf ball looking things, receiving stations, talking to the satellites as the satellites orbit the Earth. They're over this particular country at this particular time, so they're beaming signals down. And it's a big relay process. And so in these communities, in these countries, in England, in Australia, in Norway, in Greenland, uh, many other places around, there are groups organizing people like you saying, we don't want our country to be part of this U.S. Star Wars first strike warfare system. And so these are the organizations that became the core of the global network that we have as members today. So all over the planet, people are organizing, building. The reason why we got into this Jeju issue is one of our South Korean board members went there and said, hey, my God, the global network, they, you know, we got to get onto this issue because they're going to have missile defense systems there on these U.S. warships. That's how we got uh, involved in that issue. So for me, I learned that we've got to globalize our resistance as they globalize corporate, as corporate global, you know, corporations go global. Capitalism works together globally. NATO has become the global resource extraction service for corporate globalization. We too have to globalize our resistance. And as we do that, and we get to know the people around the world who are organizing against this, in every place imaginable, we begin to see that, oh my God, we're not alone. And we don't have to do this all by ourselves. People in New York don't have to stop this thing by yourself. People in the United States don't have to stop this thing by ourselves. But we work together all over the world. We really can have and do have a great power, greater power than we realize. Let me stop there. Thank you very much for listening. We'll open it up. We can chase down.